about how to classify the fixed points of parental loss in the RG flow by using stable distributions. So I argue that all the fixed points of parental loss is given by stable distributions. Then, uh, just to recap, a uh, stable distribution uh, can be parametric of four parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And this is the Fourier transform of the probability distribution of a stable distribution. This is the characteristic function. And so you have what? You have a scale parameter that sets the, the, the size of the peak. This side here, for example, this is the role of standard deviation in the Gaussian. You have the characteristic exponent here, alpha, that tells you what kind of distribution that is. For alpha equals 2, this is the Gaussian. And we have the location parameter delta that tells you where the peak is centered. That plays the role of the first momentum, momentum in the Gaussian case. And you have a skewness parameter that tells you how asymmetric is the distribution. If, it, if it's to the left or to the right. In the Gaussian case, this is zero. Okay, so we saw that the, if you have a random log where each step has this kind of distribution, the sum of n steps also has this kind of distribution where the parameter scales like this. So the location parameter goes linear, and the scale parameter goes with a power one over alpha. Okay. So this is the procedure of course grain that we did on the random walks. Then after we randomize our distance to keep the, the distance scale like gamma fixed, you get the RG flow for for these parameters. When do we find this? This space of RG flows. Where I choose a plane with fixed uh, gamma, because gamma is fixed, so just a plane here. And we have here the location parameter and the characteristic exponent. So here is the Gaussian case, alpha equals 2. Here is the Gaussian distribution, alpha equals 1. And you have what? That for this yellow line here are all the fixed points with delta equals zero. And this other line here for alpha equals one is another set of fixed points. But this goes for arbitrary delta. And you have that for alpha bigger than one, you have a family of unstable fixed points. Any perturbation by uh, location parameter delta pulls away from the fixed point. And for alpha less than one, you have a stable fixed point. And the formation by a uh, location parameter pulls to the fixed point when you do our RG flow. Okay? Any question?
So now this uh, Levy walk, where each step is given by the Levy distribution that is for alpha and cos half. Now you see one thing here, that extreme events occur frequently. Like, you doesn't give only, only small steps. You can give small steps in a, in a region, then you make a big jump. Give small steps in another region, then, then a big jump. So, uh, extreme events are not rare, like in the Gaussian case. This is the Gaussian walk for alpha equals one. Uh, now extreme events are more rare, but they still occur. But you have a fluctuation here, then you make a big jump, another fluctuation, and so on. And as you approach two, extreme events become more and more rare. And the jumps you can make are smaller. So this is some distribution for three halves. Take uh, 10,000 numbers and divide it in sets of 200 and 
2,500 numbers and calculate the mean in each one, they'll give very different numbers. One gives 16, the other gives 0, and so on. It doesn't have any mean. I heard the story that some guy had to retract his paper because he said that it had a mean, like distribution of work weights. That follows one of these cases. And now, what is the physical meaning of this? that this follows a, the probability distribution of x follows a differential equation called the Fokker plane equation Thank you. 
derivative that we define as this. Where f is the Fourier trans f of p is the Fourier transform of p, then multiply by this momentum. The inverse of the transform, we have a definition of a fraction derivative. Do anyone can see why this is the definition of fraction derivative? It's uh, in previous grades, you reduce the axis multiplication. Yes, then you just change the integer power to a fractional power. Then you have a fractional derivative and you have fractional calculus. So the stable distributions with the Curtis point out satisfy this equation where you have what? That the diffusion, the, the scale parameter of this stable distribution is given by this. That is like the that case, but here for every try out. And then now you see that for alpha less than two. This diffuses faster than the square root of that. So this spread is faster than the Gaussian case. So the diffusion here is faster. Particle. So drop a drop of in some fluid, for example, it spreads faster than the Gaussian case because it goes with a bigger power. Okay. So this is the physics. So part of the physics is that as you move that way in that diagram, things start to diffuse quicker. Yes. That is related with the big jumps that you have, right? Uh. So you do big jumps and then the diffusion is faster. And No, 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 I'm asking you. Oh, okay, no, no, no. These I did myself, so I can get that scaling process and so on. Oh, okay. This part, in uh, case I should say reference. So, for stable distributions, I looked at notes by Nolan called stable distributions. Can you send uh, in the email the yes. references? Send the in the email to everyone yeah. and then you put in the this references for the reference. And I can add them to the, my PDF and I can also reply to everyone with those notes that I If you see there is a whole literature about this fraction of the pressure of weight. There's a what, sir? A whole literature. Like people, fractional Schrodinger equation, fractional anything in the pressure equation. People do this. The just change the exponent here to alpha and it's so good. Kind of different Let me recap a little bit. Well, 
what the what we had seen last time and uh, So we started from matrix models and we saw that the graphs of matrix models, so who was not here last time? Did you see the video? No. Uh, the, 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 the one yesterday, it was the last one, where I asked, no. The, the last one I didn't scratch. The one yesterday, the one yesterday, no, the one on Wednesday. About matrix models. No, the last one where I just took a look. Do you know what matrix models are? No? Okay, so, so you know Gaussian integration, right? So and you know that when you have a Gaussian, a Gaussian integration, two point functions are given by the inverse of the quadratic form. Right? The propagator is whatever appears in the exponent. And matrix models that we were studying last time where objects where in the exponent you have something quadratic, but you are integrating over matrices that are n by n. In the example we were doing, these guys were their emission matrices. So it was not numbers, it was not vectors, it was matrices. And the kinetic term was something like minus one half, or we were putting uh, some number here for convenience, of g squared. And then the kinetic term, which is m squared, but because they are matrices, we, to get a number, we write trace of m squared. Right? So this is the analog of x squared as a vector, or more general, or x squared, it's just a number. Right? But now we have matrices, so we have a trace of m squared. Which is equal to m i j m j i. Right? That's the definition of the trace. And this led to the propagator, where if I have expectation value of two matrices, m i j m k l, right? in the same way as the propagator of two x's was just giving the inverse of the matrix. The matrix here is very simple to invert because it's diagonal. We did it last time. And the result is that there is a g squared, there is a g squared here. But otherwise, it just identifies the indices of the matrix. The initial first index of the first matrix must be the last index of the second. And the last index of the first matrix must be equal to the first index of the second. Which in pictures we said that, well, any matrix has two indices. We said the first index has an arrow going out, the second index an arrow going in. Then if I look from this side, this arrow is coming in, this is going out, so it tells the first index is the last, the first is the last from this matrix. Where I'm putting indices here, i, j, and here, k, l. So this would be the propagator. Similarly, if we have vertices, the vertices we were saying plus, it was convenient to also keep the 1 over g squared here for normalization. And then we had the sum over n of tn trace of m to the n. In other words, this is t3 times a cubic vertex, where I multiply the in my matrix, which means that it has two indices. The second index is multiplied, 
So I get this picture plus T4 times this picture. That is, everything becomes fat. Everything instead of being lines becomes now these ribbons. And that's why these graphs are called fat graphs or ribbon graphs, which now have some thickness here and here. Where again, this trace of M cube is M, the index, the last index of one matrix is the first index of the second, and so on. So if I draw arrows here, this arrow just encode matrix multiplication. IJ, IJK, and K also. And similarly for all these traces. So these are the vertices. If I expand on the edge, I'm computing the expectation value of these objects. And these are the propagators. And this is the propagator. So this, in Feynman diagram language, we call the vertices. And this, we call the propagators. And then, as we, are, we were drawing graphs, we saw that uh, there are graphs we can draw, say, like this, where I am, for example, if I bring down two quartic vertices, I could imagine, say, a graph where I just connect this guy, connect this guy, I connect this guy with a propagator, and I finally connect this guy and this graph we will compute by summing over the color that flows here so there is one face here that the color can flow another one here, another one here and another one outside and therefore this diagram will give n to the 4 because for each color I can sum over its index then it has two vertices and therefore it comes with 1 over g squared squared because each vertex can multiply by 1 over g squared and then it has 1, 2, 3, 4 propagators and each propagator comes with a g squared squared g is 4 propagators like that so g squared to the power 4 right? each propagator with a g squared so in total this uh, diagram was equal to n squared, it was useful to write like this, to write n squared times g squared n squared where this combination was defined as lambda, the tooth coupling which we have fixed as we take g to 0 and then to infinity and the diagram is proportional to n squared, which is big. Because this diagram is a planar diagram that can be drawn on a plane. And thus, it comes with a factor of n squared. But if the graph could not be drawn on the plane, if these lines were crossing and you had to draw it on a genus 1 surface, this would come with an n to the 0, for example. And so, when we sum over graphs, we were summing over topologies, and each topology came with a higher and higher power length. So let's just draw one more example. Let's draw an example of a genus 1 graph, and check this statement that I just said now. I'm sorry, the g squared uh, to the 4, where did it come from? Where did it come from? The term g squared to the 4, where, where did it come from? It's g squared to the 4, so this were the loops of the faces. This was the vertices. And this was the edges. Each edge comes with a G squared. There are four propagators. Each propagator comes with a G squared because of this normalization. that I could remove the g-square from here and then I don't have these funny g-squares and propagators 
if I rescale my matrix G, and then each term here would come with its own power G. Right? Then we have all the coupling in the vertices, and we have no coupling in the kinetic term. Right? So in a different color, let's see how that would go. So in a different color, let's do the computation where here I have one, but then here I will need to insert G, I will scale M by G, so G to the end. Right? That's actually equivalent, right? So let's see how the counting would work in that case. Now, in that case, number of faces is the same counting, edges, so this is the same, n to the 4, times, times, edges now come with propagator 1, there is no factor coming from here, right? But now, each vertex, n is equal to 4, so each vertex comes with g squared, because it's g to the 4 over g squared, so each vertex here will come with g squared, so it would be now g squared squared for these two vertices. And in total, I get g to the 4. Okay? So this is in the second normalization, this is in the first normalization. Right? Same thing, phases, vertices, and edges. Uh, yes? Question. Well, so the first class of Gaussian integration, you stated that, that at the end, the way that we decided uh, how to picturally represent the, the, the contraction was, was up to us, right? It was, yes. it was up to convention. But it looks like in the discussion of my matrix models, like there is some there is some like definite way that you're very quickly identifying like the primary rules associated to 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 a certain thing, and I don't I don't see how 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 it is immediate. I mean, you immediately see uh, what the primary rule is to be associated with a certain thing that we want to compute. So, I'm not sure if people understood, I, I think I understood the question, but maybe other people were not sure to understand. So this is about when we were in the Gaussian model and we extend two vertices down, we could think of after bringing down having 2x to the 4 or 1x to the 8. Right? So with 1x to the 8, the counting was immediate, it was 7 double factorial. And with two vertices down, we had to distinguish various graphs. But that's because x to the 4 is x, x8 to the 8 is x to the 4, 4. Right. So it's the same point. But trace of m squared times trace of m squared is not trace of m to the 8. Right? So I cannot just say it's trace of m to the 8. It's really two different objects. In other words, this diagram here, we can write it explicitly, but it's going to be boring. It's expectation value of what? 1 trace m i j m j k m k l m l i, that's one trace of m to the 4, and that's a loop of indices that clo finished closing, that's this guy, times m, and now I have another one, that's with other letters, a, b, m, b, c, m, c, d, and d, a, and I'm computing this expectation part. What do I do now? Forget about pictures, now I just start to be contracting, say this guy with this guy, this guy with this one, for example, this one, this one, and finally this one with this one. And I sum over all possible pairs of weak contractions. But if I want to associate a picture to it, whereas before it's the same, because it was just number, 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 M, 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 there were no indices. So it was totally up to me. Do I put all these guys coming from an eightfold vertex? Right? They were just they had no labels. Yeah. So whatever, who cares? It's the same thing. I could choose eight, I could choose four, four, I could choose three, three, two, whatever, just the same counting. Here of course it matters, right? Coupling these two guys to share an index is different from coupling these two that don't. So in one case I'm contracting neighboring guys, in the other case I'm contracting two separate structures. Okay, so now I guess what why every vertex now has to four has four uh, lines coming out, fat lines coming out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so for each weak contraction you're putting a, a 1 over g squared, right? Uh, because that is not no, my g, my g squared. G squared. Uh -huh. And, and that, then the factor that's accompanying the g squared to the 4, that's the counting, right? Uh, so you mean that this will come with the next number here? 
No, no. So, uh, I'm saying that g squared to the 4 is what comes from the propagator. Now, there's some degeneracy of how many ways it can be organized, the i, j, k. Right, so this is one graph. This picture is one graph. It's one weak contraction. You have to do all weak contractions, so you have to sum over all graphs. Yeah, but with that graph, there is a degeneracy. We don't need that graph, right? There's a counting that we have to do. It is done with that. I, I draw one weak contraction. I construct, consider one weak contraction. I draw the corresponding graph, then it's one to one. There's no degeneracy. Okay. Now, it could be that many weak contractions give graphs that are isomorphic. Right? So, one weak contraction is this. Uh -huh. This is okay. of one graph. Yeah. Now, maybe there are some weak contractions that give the same graph. Yeah, exactly. That's so true. That weak contraction is not equal to that number that we have there, right? Of course it is. No, I mean, this one in particular, I don't know. Because I would not be careful trying to make this equal to this, right? Yeah, but the number that we have there is once we've. It's counting all the weak contractions that yield the same data. No, this number is a single weak contraction. That's why it comes with coefficient 1. Because all I do is count the color, the color loops, nothing else. I don't count combinatorics or making various graphs. It's one weak contraction. Okay, I thought that, that, that every the, the weak contraction had just like, it was just multiplying the propagator. <coughs> and since we have... Um, uh, So the number that we have written is the propagator associated to that weak contraction. Uh, weak contractions, uh, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Weak, uh, uh, I'm thinking about two point functions. Two point functions are the propagators, right? A propagator is one weak contraction. Like this field with this field is the propagator between Mij and Mp. Yeah, okay. That connects two minutes. So to calculate the whole thing, we have to, to sum over, so every term in the sum, in the weak expansion, is going to have a g squared to the 4, right? Every term will have a g squared to the 4, because every term has 4 propagators, because there are 8 fields. Exactly, okay. So all of them have this. g squared to the 4. And the other all term is counted. So all of them have 1 over g squared to the 4 as well. Because all of them, because this is by definition, right? This vertex. K multiplied by 1 over g squared, and this vertex K multiplied by 1 over g squared when I bring it down from the action. So all of them also come with this factor. I mean, just because this expectation value is multiplied by 1 over g squared. Squared, because it's 1, 1. Oh, so when, we, when we bring that 1 over g squared to the front yeah. explanation. Okay, okay, I see how that appears. Yeah. So, so you get two balls with this. Now, this one is what will change because you'll have to count how they are connected to see how many faces you have. And here we have four faces, but with a different contraction, we will have a different number. And this is what changes, and this is how the graphs need to be reorganized. Okay. Now, some things that I'm saying, like Gaussian integration of numbers is probably trivial for you. Some things I'm saying, like Gaussian integration of matrices, might not be trivial. They are not trivial. You have to write the notes after the lecture and study the game on yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So this thing you need to practice. You cannot just uh, listen and understand, right? But you should, uh, you should try to learn what is weak theorem. We contract a few things, contract this guy with this guy, we just like the double functions that we wrote, do these same things, and see how these factors of n are generated. Okay. So, so just to finish this, con this conclusion. This weak contraction is not this one. Why not? Why is this weak contraction not the same as this picture here? So here I wrote one weak contraction. Here I wrote one diagram. But this diagram is not exactly this choice of pairing of x. Because we're, we're... So if we start from, from the left vertex, <coughs> huh? 
then we're contracting to the to to the other exactly to to, to the other two and uh, then we're contracting other two and then we're contracting other two and just passing that out.
beta beta means this guy is contacted with this one. Oh, so no, because it's the same matrix, right? So, so, beta, uh, so, so, this guy is contracted with this one from another trace. So, it doesn't matter who is who because they are all equivalent. So, let's say that this one is contracted to this. Right? So this contraction, this contraction identifies these indices of this matrix that Rij will have to become the same as AB. So if this is AB, it means this guy here is the matrix Ij. Right? Now, if this is AB, the next one is here, BC. This one that contracts with the next one here, which is, if this is I, this is L. Right? Mm -hmm. So the next one here connects with the next neighbor here with this one. Right? And then the next one, C D, C D, right? This index is C, it's the same index, this is D. C D contracts the next guy, guy which is L with the other index, L K. Right? This is L and this is K. So I contract, let's put this, this guy here. 
I contract two neighboring guides of my matrix, right? The JK and the KL, which is the same notation that we have there, which means I do this contract. Right? This is this thing here. You agree? I connect these two fields. Then I connect IJ with BC, so I connect one guy from one trace, IJ to BC. So I connect this guy. So I'm going to cross out the ones I did. I did this, I did this. Now this one, Li, the last one, Li goes to CD. So CD is here, it goes to the last one here. Which means I was lucky. If you want that I draw, I got a graph that can be drawn much later again. This. And so this graph must come with an n square overall because it's again a planar graph. And let's see that it is the same as before. And it is, because this graph has one, two, three, four faces. So it contributes in the same way as the other graph we had before, which is n square, g square, n squared. Right? Do 
clearly because they are identified. So I put this, this goes here, it's the same as this time. This is the same as this, and these four things are the same thing they are So this is an example of a four square quadrangulation. Let's check in a few examples. So let's check 
And the examples on the right. So right from Sorry? It's up, right? Yes, it's two. Okay, so let's check on the right examples. The right examples, how many vertices do they have? Actually, both have the same number of vertices. Two. two. How many faces? Four. And how many edges? Four. Four. Which is equal to two. Which means that the genus is? And the left example, vertices. <coughs> How many vertices do we have? Four. Here, here, four. four. How many faces? Four faces? Six. No. We set the graph for the morphic, and I already gave the result for the other graph. Oh, four. Four. Let's count them just to be sure. One face is here, the other face is here, that goes here. The other one is here, that goes here. And the other one is the rest. So, four faces, edges. And each propagator uses two of them, so eight. How many did they count in I just count the total number of fields, four plus four plus four plus four, and divided by two because the, each propagator connects two fields. It's what we were saying before, we have eight, so there are four connections. Now there are sixteen, so there are eight connections. So it gives zero, which implies that this can, must be drawn on the surface of genus one. Now what will happen is that if you would contract in another way, like instead of contracting this guy in 3D, you contract this guy with this guy and this guy with this guy, you get many more faces. Because now you get many more powers of n. So you keep the other things fixed, but you increase the number of faces, so you decrease the chains. So the other graph would be zero. Right? So the graph where I connect these two and I connect these two, indeed can be drawn on a plane, obviously, and it is genus. You can easily see that you get two extra faces if you do that. So it worked out and you get genus. So the graphs get organized by genus, and the full partition function is equal to a sum over genus. N starts with genus 0 at 2, and then each genus is more and more suppressed. And then for each genus, there is the sum over all graphs of that topology, and that sum depends on the tooth coupling, lambda. And this, if you want, this was the result of tooth, by the way, it's nice that tooth is here. And this looks, or is the definition, if you want, of what we would call a string-like partition function, a string partition function, or a path integral, or, or a sum over random Then summing over all possible triangulations and quadrangulations and so on of these surfaces with given weights. Okay. Any question here? Some of our other lattices, 
where each side is connected with four neighbors, and at each side I can have some spin sigma that can be plus or minus one, and here another sigma that can be plus or minus one. Right? But the way they are connected, instead of being connected in a perfect square lattice, it's a random lattice. You can have connections like this, sometimes they form triangles, sometimes they form pentagons, and you could imagine having some random lattice like this. Let's suppose that each vertex, you see, each vertex has valency 4, that's a choice, we don't need to, we could put other valences, but let's say that the valence is 4, but the faces can be various things, it can be triangles, it can be squares, it can be pentagons, but the vertices are 4, we could even have things like this, where this plane would come up with itself, And we would like to sum over the lattices and sum over the spins. So we have a fluctuating surface where not only we sum over the spins, but we also sum over the possible lattice configurations. So the goal is to find this would be my partition function Z. And the goal is to ask if we can find a nice matrix integral that if we could compute this matrix integral, it would solve this problem. Right. So we like to write a matrix integral that solves this problem completely. I'm studying this Eisen model on a random lens. The goal is to have an integral, a solution of this form. There is an integral Z that is equal to this random model. Right. And now that we have some experience of summing over quadrangulations, we could try to add spins to the quadrangulations. So that's what we are going to do now. Okay? So, so again, just a comment. Why did we get squares of the dual graph here? It was squares in the dual graph. It was quadrangulations, in other words, squares, because we had party vertices. So Starting with particle vertices in the dual graph gives quadrangulations. Starting with cubic vertices in the dual graph, it will be triangulations. Okay? But we are not in the dual graph language, we are in the original graph language. The original graph, we want valence in four, so we will have matrix models with four vertices. With vertices with four sets. Right? Because they generate graphs like the white one, or like this one, or like this one. And all these graphs are the graphs where we want to put spins, right? Spin here, I want to put the spin here, or I want to put the spin here, up, down, up, up, three spins up, one spin down. I want to put graphs on this graph, I want to put spins on this graph and sum over the spins. Okay? Okay, so I would, I would like a proposal. What do you guys propose? What would be a strategy for trying to do that? To add this extra degree of freedom? What 
to be proposed, but now what I want is this. Yeah. Where in this vertex I have a spin that can be plus one or can be minus one. And then the spins connect each other. There is a weight associated with each connection. But as I said, the spin can be plus, plus, but it can also be minus. So guess what would we try to modify that model to get this extra structure? Multiply the spin in interaction parts because you need to stay spin in the vertices. So you need to every time that a vertice appear, the spin also appears. So put the spin in the interaction curve. Good, so that's the so what's our next step? Victor. Victor is proposing to so maybe insert the spin here. Something like this, right? Yes. Yeah. That's the problem is that I cannot see how it will appear it's been plus and minus one. Yeah. You could put, you could multiply that by sigma, i. But then, uh, how do you say which sigma do you put? Sigma at which side? You just put the letter sigma? We want four sigmas, right? Mm, no, right? At each side, I have a spin. Right? My sides are spins now. At each side, there is a spin. One at each side. And then, this spin connects with this curve, interacts with this spin with some interaction energy, like we wrote for adding on. So there is a sigma variable for this guy, there is a sigma variable for this. So what sigma am I going to put there? If I just put the letter sigma, it's not associated to any particular vertex. And then I expand down and it's always the same sigma. So how do it? doesn't seem to work right away at least. It's along the right direction, but it's not good enough. Sigma i, sigma j, 
minus 1, this 1 is just a constant. And I want to sum in my annual tone and I want to sum over all possible names. In other words, I want for each possible link, rather over i and j, I want this factor, e to the i with the j, sigma i, sigma j, minus 1. Minus 1 is just for convenience. So what happens when the spins are equal? I want 1. Right? So this is equal to 1 for equal spins. And when the spins are different, it's equal to e to the minus 2j for different spins. When the spins are plus and minus. Do you agree? So that's the weight I want to associate to each edge. So I want this propagator to come with the weight 1, this propagator I want to give 1, this propagator between plus and plus I want to give 1, and this propagator between plus and minus I want to give e to the minus 2j. Right? What about the vertex? Well, the vertex depends if in my partition function I could want to do, I could also want to weight e to the minus. For example, I could imagine that I also want a very natural thing to do would be to sum over i beta h at position i sigma i. I could add a magnetic field at position i. Right? Then, whenever I have a spin up, I want weight e to the beta h and whenever, let's put h, h is the same x it must be e to the beta h and e to the minus beta h when the spin is negative so this vertex I want to can with e to the beta h and this one I want it to be weighted by e to the minus beta h if there is a magnetic field at each side right? In fact, I could also do something else. I could say that I have some chemical potential minus beta mu times sine over i of 1. That just counts how many sides there is. And there is an energy cost for building a big lattice. It's like each, each, adding each lattice point costs some chemical potential, right? So your materials and your lattice will grow or decrease, and you can control the size of your lattice by playing with mu. The chemical potential conjugates to how many sides you have. Right? So this would be chemical potential, just to make the model richer. Chemical potential conjugates to the size of the spin shape of the lattice, and then each side comes with an extra minus beta mu. Doesn't matter if it's up or down, just because it's a set piece, it costs some energy to add this lattice side. And now the rules of the game is I sum over surfaces, I draw the graphs, and I associate this weight according to a given graph. Right? So if I have a graph like this, for example, where here there is a plus and a minus, right? What weight do I associate to this? This graph? According to the rules, there are three, one, two, three, four connections between plus and minus. So there is e to the minus 8 beta j. These are the four propagators that go between plus and minus. As you seen in the model, do not change the topological properties of the graph, right? Right. So this graph will come with four propagators between plus and minus. So this is the minus 8 beta j. Right? It comes with no magnetic field because it has one up, one down, so it comes, the, the magnetic field cancels, and it comes with two sides, so minus two beta mu. That's the contribution of this graph. Right? And it comes with three faces, it's a planar graph, four faces, so it comes with an end to the four outside.
So now we can write a proposal for this model that implements this. What do I need in order to have these three types of propagators? What should I change there? Right. We did not answer yet, but we said what we want. We said we want these finding graphs. What model gives these finding graphs? What model gives these propagators and these vertices? So how many vertices will there be in the action? Are there? How many fields are, are there in the, in the model? Just this, this P and the pages? Yeah. No. What does it mean, a propagator, when I put two things on the side of the propagator? This means that there are two types of matrices, M plus and M minus. And they can have a two-point function that is not zero between plus and plus and between minus and plus. So let's say that I have two Gaussian matrices instead of M, I will have two. And this vertex, let's try, will be trace of A to the 4, and this will be trace of B to the 4. And this picture here is, what I'm drawing here, is the propagator between the matrix A and A. This is the propagator between matrix B and B. And this is the propagator between matrix A and B. So all I need to do is cook up a model that has off-diagonal propagators. The propagator is not diagonal. A with A is 1. B with B is 1, but A with B is not 0. Okay? And if the propagator is of diagonal, I add two quantum vertices like this, and I'm done. Okay. So let's be, let's write it explicitly. So the claim is the following. The model is this. Z is equal. Let's write it and see that it works. I integrate over two matrices, A and B, that represent spins up and spins down. Exponential of minus kinetic term. Now let's see kinetic term. What is it? One half, another of two types of matrices. So let me write it like this AB, and here AB, right? And so one half, trace, right? There is a trace. And now here I'm going to put a 2 by 2 matrix. If the 2 by 2 matrix was 1, 1, it would be just trace of A squared plus trace of B squared. It would be two matrices, each of them with propagator 1. You agree? Yeah. That's not what I want. I want one matrix to have propagator 1, and A with B, the off diagonal, to have propagator e to the minus 2j. e to the minus 2j. But this is A, and the propagator is the inverse. So I want the inverse of this 2 by 2 matrix. So you just compute the inverse of this 2 by 2 matrix, and this is your kinetic term. So if you compute explicitly this, this term here, this is the kinetic term that generates those propagators. Looks like this. It's trace of a squared plus b squared plus e to the minus 2 beta j times an a b term, product of a b, everything divided by 1 minus e to the minus 4 beta j. That's just inverting this 2 by 2 matrix, doing the multiplication, and writing everything up. If I were to write this right away, how would you compute the propagator? Well, you would exactly write this as a matrix, you analyze. It's done so that it works. It's engineered such that this kinetic term generates this propagator. Right? It's engineered like that. That's why there is this smart minus one. So you see how cool it is to have this matrix where you just know we invert this. Then I know right away how to generate nice kinetic terms. I put whatever I want and I invert it. Right? Now this kinetic term in white generates those Feynman rules. Okay, so we have this as the kinetic term, and then we add the vertices. 
So here it was n to the 4 and two vertices. So to get rid of this 4 and make it a square, I want to put something like the analog of this 1 over g squared. It turns out that the convenient thing to do, if we can check it now, let me write it, is to put 1 over n, okay, let me write here, plus s in, this is going to be the interaction. So let's write the interactions. We wrote the kinetic term that generates this, and I want these two interactions. So S interaction is what? Is 1 over n e to the, let me write this one, beta h minus beta mu times trace of h to the 4 plus the same thing with h to minus h trace b to the four. So this is our model. So 
referred to as H. H yes. is the magnetic field. Oh. Right? So each side comes with H minus H if it's negative, plus H if it's positive. So this is this thing here. Right? It's just the energy. Well, my configuration where all spins are interact is the Ising energy.
So, so if you are interested, I suggest that Google made it model review open, see, oh, this section looks interesting, come to me and say, Pedro, I thought I could talk about orthogonal polynomials, or I could talk about uh, counting and triangulations using matrix models, explaining some numbers related to genus surface property, or I could talk about uh, the large n limit of these matrix models, how do I study the planar graphs, which are the most dominant ones, there you can really you set a point approximation and so this complete one. And uh, there are so many things to tell, just any review will follow a particular direction and there are many interesting topics inside. So I would suggest not for the week after, but for the week after that someone would uh, explain something about metrics model. So Ivan, you wanted to? I, I want to work on this because I, I don't understand it very well. I don't really want to understand it, but I don't think that in two weeks I'm going to be able to have something. Uh, I mean, two weeks is just too little because uh, I, I mean, I really want to do it because I want to understand it, but just because for that same reason that I don't understand it, I think that doing two weeks would be hard. Uh, maybe okay. we can go later. Uh, okay, we can also not do a presentation on matrix models because I think if it's matrix models, it must be in two weeks, otherwise, it's going to be too late. Oh, okay. Right? We are in Already in two weeks we are going not to be doing matrix models. So not going to we can also present something else. You can try to present about Casa Paulo the exact solutions in the exact solutions, right? He uh, so the, the original paper of Casa Paulo when he proposes this, uh, the exact solution was not just Casa Paulo, I think it was Casa Paulo and collaborators, but uh, I can look up the references and tell you if not. Okay. So so okay, so then in two weeks, Peter will tell us about um, some techniques to try to solve this matrix model. I think it might be challenging because, it, as I said, it's a two matrix model. Without explaining first some things about solving the one matrix model might be hard. But uh, we will see. I'll send you a references and uh, you will see if you think. On the other hand, because it's really two techniques, some of the techniques we would use to explain the solution would then not be useful here because you really need to develop some particular techniques to this particular model. So maybe it's not so bad to start directly with the hardest model because you develop right away the best techniques that you work always. Yeah, but uh, what is the small coupling here? Is it beta j? Which is zero? You see there are many parameters, right? There's h, there's j, there's mu, and there is n. What's the simplest of all? Well, n to infinity and you keep planar graphs only. Yes. So 1 over n squared is a coupling that controls genus of surfaces. You want to suppress higher genus, you send them to infinity. Right? The other cap is mu. If you send mu to infinity, you have lattices with zero or one size. Okay? If they have zero or one size, it's also easy to study. Right? You just have one spin. And then the next term is two sides, so you have two spins. Okay, so that you can compute analytically by hand. So that's kind of boring, so it's not so good to take mu to infinity, it's trivial. So let's leave mu finite, and all spins matter. Then you have the usual in couplings here. And now you can do two things. You can take a very large or very big, and this will be what we we'll call high temperature or low temperature expansions. Right, so this will be other things on a good place. Right, so you could put the chemical potential that if the, if the magnetic field, what well, matters the magnetic field? If the magnetic field is big, you can make all spins be negative, for example, because you don't want any spins up. What happens when all spins are negative? So if, let's imagine we make h to infinity, okay? Then all spins are negative. Then it's smarter to not put here h, but not to sort part of h into mu. If we want to send h to infinity, we would like to have this minus 1, right? So, which means that I redefine this mu and there is a mu deal. Right? Yeah, putting a 1 there is just counting how many sides there are. You okay? So, let me do it in a different color so that it's not confusing. So, 
So I'm saying you can also put a mu tilde here, and then I sum sigma i minus 1. Now, if you send h to infinity, you only want to have sigma i equal to plus 1, because if sigma i is minus 1, this costs a huge amount of energy. sigma equal minus 1, because if sigma is plus 1, this, this will blow up. No, it was correct. Minus 1, and sigma will be plus 1, because otherwise, if sigma is minus 1, this is exponentially suppressed. It kills this right away, but in the end, it's huge. So all sigmas want to be plus 1 when h goes to infinity, which means that this part is just going to 0. So all this sum here goes to 1, right? which means that I sum over a graph with 1. Right? So this is the one matrix model, right? where I just don't put any spins. I just count graphs that are perpendicular. Right? So solving and this thing here, in that case, would be related to this t. That says how many vertices there are. Right? So this is basically c to the n. Right? So in that sense, solving the one matrix model is solving this part. Where I replace the Isaac model by one. So it's easier. Of course, right? I throw away the Isaac model and just count correlations or count random circles. Yeah, I think what's nice is that instead of just one, I can put this full interesting structure on top. The only thing we do is put two matrices instead of one. So that's definitely simplifying it. Which in your language is what you were saying. It corresponds to sending this guy to zero while keeping this one fixed. Then it, it amounts to yeah, yeah, trivializing this problem. And you kill all that one type, because you kill one versus the one type, one matrix never shows up, so I can ignore B completely, and I get just one matrix one. And this solution might have a problem with how to find the factor that you know? No. I, 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 well, no, that, 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 that question I cannot answer. That's why. So how do you compute what the theory is? Okay, it's long. It's a course. Maybe it's not, but it's a course. There's a technology. You know, we, this will be the beginning, right? Yeah. What they are asking is uh, how we study matrix models. So, the, the, as I said, the first thing people did often is they go to eigenvalues. They go from n squared variables to n variables by going to eigenvalues. Here you cannot do because you have a times b. A times b is not a function of eigenvalues of a and eigenvalues of b. There is a relative angle between the two matrices. That's the first thing that fails. So then what you do, you use group theory, you use characters. And you have to decompose this expression into characters we reduce for representations so of GLN, characters of matrix A, characters of matrix B, and explore orthogonality of characters of GLN. So there is a, there is a character decomposition of this expression. You decompose into functions that are invariant under the group action of rotating these matrices, and that's how you go about solving. It's really sophisticated. Just to give you an example. So this is a model where I have a matrix A and a matrix B and a coupling between A and B. What could be a generalization if instead of Ising, is it still recording? Yeah. What could be if instead of Ising to spin up and spin down, imagine I want three spins. Right? Now you could, you could guess right away, right? What should we do? Sorry? And another matrix. And now we have trace of A to the 4, trace of B to the 4, trace of C to the 4. Right? And now, what's the interaction between them? Well, if they are equivalent, if for example they, they give something when they are equal and something when they are different, then we have an interaction AB, BC, and CA. All possible interactions appear, meaning that we have couplings between um, all possible species of spin. So with three spins, we will now have 
something like this, where by this I mean that in the kinetic term there is an AB, there is a BC, and there is a CD. Okay, with four spins, there are two now possibilities that you could have, because with four spins there are two natural things you could have. One is everyone couples to everyone, so all that matters is they're equal or not. So you have in the kinetic term, there are matrices and there are all possible products up here. A, B, etc. Okay. This is a particular case of this. When I have three matrices, this, everyone is connected. Yeah. Now, I could imagine another thing where I'm studying a statistical model where I have n choices, in this case four possibilities. And spin and, they, and I couples with choice I couples with choice I plus one. But not, not with the other choices. That's more like, yeah, this is like a plots model, and the one I'm saying would be one where the spins couple like this, and then they close. This would be an interaction AB, BC, CD, and DA. Right? So this means that there, are, that there is an interaction AB, BC, CD, DA. Okay? So that's a statistical model where again I have some energy cost if I have two neighboring spins that differ by uh, that whose color differs by one unit. Right? If I don't have this line, that means that I don't have this DA. So that means that the values take from a minimum value to a maximum value, and if they are neighbors, there's some energy cost. Right? So the one which is without this connection, so so Without this guy, it's called an open chain of matrix models because I have matrix A that couples with B, with C, with D. Right? Now, with the line, it's a closed spin chain matrix model where I have a bunch of matrix models coupled in a chain. Okay? It turns out that this open chain of matrix models, of which this is a particular case with just two matrices, where there is A and B, and there is AB. People know how to solve. And it's closed, there's no solution yet. People don't know yet how to solve this matrix model. In general, when you have like four matrices and you want to couple them, and people don't know yet how to solve it. So it's an example on how many three of these things are open it's solved, closed it's not solved. Except in three, because three closed is the same as fully connected, and fully connected are solved. So what's solved is fully connected and open. But closed, it's not so. For example. And I know, I, I know, why would I know this? I know this actually because it turns out that to solve some problems in uh, holography related to, to studying surfaces and some antecedent space times to describe uh, any post quantum superior mills, we recently mapped the problem we wanted to study into a matrix model problem that had four matrices. And it was exactly the case that never, was never solved before. So uh, it's exactly the one where you have ABC, this picture here, where I have four matrices, A, B, C, and D, and they are coupled in this virtual way. So we landed exactly on the one model that people don't know how, how, how to solve the how to solve yet. So I was checking with Kazakov and all the matrix model experts. Uh, they are, the, yeah, Ivan Kostov, who is one of the great experts into matrix model, yesterday was trying to solve the model to, to see if he could make some progress. Okay, so that's it. So, you arrived at the time. So, next week, the presentation is by Carlos from Forosa. And uh, we close the parentheses on Gaussian integration and we go back to the Gaussian model and then Poising model.